On this episode of Marketing Mavericks, we talked to Patrick Adams about the intimate apparel industry, Victoria's Secret, and more. We also talked to Brendan Gann about how to use YouTube from big bands to small business. Stay tuned. That's up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Marketing Mavericks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Welcome to Marketing Mavericks, the intersection of marketing and the internet, where we talk about everything that's happening on the web how brands are using the internet, how we're using YouTube, social media, and much more. Today, we're gonna talk about the undergarment, under parallel industry, and how that's growing, moving from the brick and mortar into the online space at a rapid pace, and the market's being flooded with bras and panties, but selling quite well. We're also gonna talk about YouTube and viral videos. The, the, The mystery of how to make a viral video is still unknown, but we do know what's working, and we know that brands and agencies are spending a lot more money in the space. We've got two guests joining us today, certainly an expert in the um, undergarment, under apparel industry, and that is Patrick Adams. He's the former head of marketing for Victoria's Secret, and he is on the board for Adore Me. Welcome, Patrick, to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. We've also got Brendan Gaughan. He is a YouTube consultant and has built a strong career in advising brands on how to use YouTube to go viral. You work with uh, <laughs> clients like Pepsi and Bud Light and Sonos and many, many more. If you look Brandon up on Wikipedia, there's a long list of people there. <laughs> Welcome both. Welcome, Brandon. Hey, hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So um, I know you guys were really excited that we were going to talk about the um, under the undergarment industry <laughs> and women's underwear. Uh, you both were like, Tanya, please have me on the show. What, you know, please. <laughs> you know, there's this huge list of people that wanted to come on, right? Absolutely. If it's about panties, I want to be there. That's what I said. (laughs) Anthony, I can barely see you, but you're blushing. All right. Um, (laughs) So, Patrick, um, I've known you for a while, mostly through social media. You were with Victoria's Secret for about five years. You're now with Adore Me, which is an Internet-based women's apparel uh, outlet. And um, they've been doing quite well. You... um, you know, Victoria's Secret is such an iconic brand, and there's so many now that have popped up in the space that Victoria's Secret really dominated for such a long mm-hmm. time. I mean, you certainly had brands that made Wakal and many others that actually make really fine women's undergarments, but now yeah. the internet space is flooded, I think, with women's undergarments, but doing so well. I mean, it's a huge market, right? $70 billion, I think, um, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's projected, I think, worldwide. for 2000, yeah. worldwide mm-hmm. for 2015. And, right. um, you know, I guess, so let's step back, you know, so you were Victoria's Secret, like I said, for five years. Right. And I've been a Victoria's Secret customer myself, but now there are so many other options. Um, yeah. What have you seen in the five years that since you started to today from the standpoint of the growth of the market? I mean, the market has really just exploded. Um, I, I, you know, first and foremost, I, I have to say that um, working for a brand like Victoria's Secret was just um, uh, awesome for, for for someone like me. Seeing um, and working with a well-built brand was uh, an absolute pleasure, uh, and and the customer base itself was was um, really just spectacular. But at, at the same time, the transition in the marketplace over the, even my last five years within the, the lingerie business um, has been completely game changing, mostly because honestly, when I entered the business, uh, a, a, a big design house like Victoria's Secret around lingerie would tell customers what they wanted, what they needed, what color palette made sense for them. Um, and then over the last five years, the customer really has gotten into the conversation by telling the designers what they like, what they don't like, what fits, what doesn't fit. And so it's really become a customer driven um, industry and business for sure. So, okay. We've seen, you know, I, that's a lot of money in that industry. And I, you know, as a consumer, I think, wow, there's so many great options. And I love the idea that I don't have to go into a brick and mortar store. Cause I can remember, you know, you and I were talking about this offline, like mall of America, there's like 
five or ten, I don't know, different uh, Victoria's Secret stores. And you'd always have like these big bins full of bras yep. and panties. And it's just like this, you know, shopping galore. That was the way that we shopped then. The way that we yep. shop now is we actually don't fill our actual basket up. We fill our virtual basket right. up, our shopping basket, and then we go back and buy. What What are you seeing as a differentiator, though? Because, again, back in the day, if I didn't go to Bloomingdale's or Dillard's or something to buy my underwear, I went to Victoria's Secret, right? So, yep. But now with so many other competitors, how, how are brands differentiating themselves online to, to get customers to engage with their product and their business? It's honestly really knowing your customer as best you possibly can. I think the brand that caters to customer need, what they're looking for, what's important to them is a brand that's breaking through. It all starts with a, with a, um, a, a very well-built, strategically built brand, which Victoria's Secret absolutely has. But you, you, you can't just live on brand alone. You really have to be able to um, cater to customers' needs, whether it be about fit or variety or size or access or value. Um, you really need to understand what's most important to your very best customers, and you better give it to them. The conversation around listening to your consumers is so yeah. important. I think um, whether you're male or female, whether you're 83 or 23, you really want um, to know that the business that uh, you, you give your money to is actually listening to you, and social media allows us to do that today. Yeah. How do you see the apparel industry, specifically the undergarment industry, the bra bras and panties out there, how do you see those businesses changing to listen to something that really a lot of women are kind of embarrassed to talk about? Maybe they don't want to share it. Maybe they're excited about it. Maybe they want to flaunt yeah. it, but it's still a very controversial kind of conversation. How do you have that conversation over social media? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still a pretty private conversation that women aren't um, having kind of really so much out in the open, but they're having it in, in more closed communities. So social allows you to create a scalable closed community where you can listen to women who have um, like um, concerns or issues or challenges and really do something about it. Um, it. It allows you to get in surgically when you have to, to create panels. It allows you to talk to big groups of individuals when you need to. It really gives you um, endless flexibility. Uh, everything from I've sat side by side with a, um, a brand buyer uh, and I've sat in big audiences with brand buyers. It really depends on what you're trying to get at. But um, technology and social specifically gives you the flexibility to do it any number of ways. Uh, topic drives how you would do it, you know, how, how, um, how personal the, the topic is. So, Patrick, um, there are so many people out there that are even building a, a, an individual brands. Brandon, um, you have a strong reputation of understanding how to focus on uh, building uh, brands and on YouTube and, you know, viral videos and that sort of thing. Uh, a YouTube star, in fact, YouTube has a whole new campaign that they've just launched to really focus on YouTube celebrities and show that, you know, um, that YouTubers can actually create their own brand. Bethany uh, Matoya is one of those that um, has created a huge following. I think they're saying she's making somewhere... Uh, around maybe I don't know forty thousand a month in um, mm -hmm. in in you know her YouTube views. What would you say about the intimacy that she shares and 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 basically the personal user and what they're sharing and on social media and YouTube? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I think uh, there are a lot of parallels to kind of what we're talking about with, around the su success of the YouTubers. And even what Patrick was talking about with uh, Adore Me, um, I think the content creators and the brands that are generating a lot of traction are the ones that it's not it's not about, you know, ultra produced content, but more about incorporating the community and the guys that understand the mechanics of, of the, the platform as well as how to create um uh, you know, uh, really create a, create a community and um, and interact with the consumers or, or viewers in a way where they feel like they're a part of the content. Those are the people that really generate the most traction. And, it, and it's very different than, um, you know, a lot of the traditional media. Um, and, and I think a great kind of example um, that I'm seeing is, you know, a year ago or Two years ago, there was the, uh, you know, YouTube gave $100 million in investment money to um, allow 
uh, for premium content creators to kind of develop content for the platform. And a lot of the people that got that money were more uh, traditional media houses and production companies and stuff. And they didn't really generate a lot of traction. And now what YouTube has done is kind of shifted their focus and um, they're with their Google preferred campaign. They're, they're highlighting folks like Bethany and Michelle Fan and um, putting them on billboards and raising awareness around them because those that really understand the nuances of the platform are the ones that are generating traction and continuing to grow. Um, and uh, if you don't understand how to, you know, uh, create that dialogue, um, it just doesn't convert. It's got to be, uh, uh, you know, one to one versus just like a pipe, you know, you yelling out to to uh, this closed audience, this captured audience like on TV. Bethany started when she was in high school. In fact, her story is kind of interesting because she actually was homeschooled because she was being bullied at school. Uh, she had she had cyberbullying that was happening to her. And so she used YouTube to kind of express herself and create her own brand. She's now got a, her own clothing line uh, with Apostle. I, I'm not saying it's Apostle. And um, and she's just, you know, launched a career. You know, we're, we're talking about targeting millennials, I think, you know, uh, although Patrick would probably say that we're also certainly in the, in the underwear garment industry, mm -hmm. we're, we're also targeting the our grandmas. But but I think, you know, many of us are trying to figure out how to engage that millennial audience. I mean, what what is somebody like Bethany doing to actually pull in the kind of viewers that are that's getting her um, a personal brand? That, that's a good question. I mean, I don't think there's like a single uh, way to encapsulate like what what it is that they're doing. But ultimately, it's it's. Um, I think it's being human and approachable. I think a lot of people, a lot of the YouTubers, um, I imagine that a lot of their appeal is the fact that it seems approachable. Um, while, uh, you know, they have millions of followers and I mean, and many of them are getting, you know, uh, cable TV numbers um, online, there's still a level of approachability that, hey, they're just like me. And that really resonates with the younger audience in particular. And YouTube is much bigger um, for uh, millennials than, than any other age group. Um, so I think I think the approachability is a big part of it in, in um, the ability of a lot of the top creators to kind of um, appear as if they're on the same level and, and actually stay on the same level versus um, kind of like what I was referring to earlier with TV. It seems like there's this separation between um, you and the content. You know, it's it's I'm pushing the content out. There's no kind of feedback loop. And, and on YouTube, there's that feedback loop. You feel like you're a part of it. Okay. Brands are moving to the internet, brands and agencies. We talked about that when we started the show. And they feel like, I think they can be a little more edgy. They can mm -hmm. say things. We saw that with Kmart. I mean, Kmart uh, came out with what I thought was some pretty funny advertising towards the end of last year. Um, they came out with, uh, well, let's watch. Sounds like you could use some big ass savings. I'd love some big ass savings. Kmart shop your way members save 30 cents a gallon. 30 cents a gallon? That's a big ass discount. Big ass discount. A really big ass discount. Really big ass discount. Honey, this solves your big ass problem. Totally solves my big ass problem. Yeah, <laughs> look at that big ass truck. A big ass man. Hello, big ass man. Shop your way members get big ass savings. Save 30 cents a gallon when you spend $50 or more at Kmart. Okay. Obviously, when they came out with that, I think that was really pushing the limit for the Kmart brand. But it was really funny. And I think probably everyone I know shared it uh, because it was interesting. I mean, when you talk about how much money it costs to to buy time. I mean, I think that's targeting, I think, just about anybody, but certainly maybe a more millennial yep. uh, edgy uh, environment. If you look at so buying a 30 second spot on um, The Big Bang Theory, which is a really popular show, especially with millennials, is is three hundred and sixty thousand dollars right so that's 30 seconds you can go viral for much less and get a lot more eyeballs i mean i think this video i'm trying to remember how many actually uh it got but it uh it was it was huge it went incredibly viral on the internet what do you say about that uh from the standpoint of the money that we're spending and the types of content we're creating brendan yeah i mean I think uh, there's it's really interesting. The the media dollars, no doubt about it. I mean, you can get a lot more bang for your buck um, in YouTube and digital as a whole. I mean, I think uh, YouTube is a, a micro kind of example of a, a macro trend. But I mean, 
you can generate a lot of earned media, which is obviously great because not only are you getting the eyeballs, but probably more important, you're actually getting people who care about the content and are engaging with it, um, which means they're more inclined to, I mean, assuming they like it, um, go and share it and, and go uh, buy it. But I think also what's really interesting is, is beyond just buying uh, uh, TV and, and getting viral videos, you can actually um, buy a lot of targeted media uh, on YouTube as well. And I think um, a lot of brands are underutilizing that component as well. I mean, there's a huge, the, the level of targeting you can get, um, you know, on a cost per view basis for that versus, uh, you know, TV, it, it doesn't even pale in comparison. You're getting a way better uh, discount or way better deal. So I'm not sure kind of why so many brands are still spending the kind of dollars on TV uh, if it's not kind of generating that earned awareness and it's not as targeted. It, it seems like more and more it's becoming irrelevant and, and YouTube is really um, uh, a really key component in, in marketing. But, you know, I would say, and I would think if you talk to most brands and agencies, they would tell you that it isn't just about creating a video online. You still see Kmart spending a lot of other, it's, it's strategy, right? It takes traditional public relations. It takes a lot of other types of advertising. Patrick, I think this is a good question for you. You focus mostly yep. on e-commerce at Victoria's Secret. And I, I think it is multi-tactic campaigns. Yeah, I mean, these, these videos are great and they're funny and we're all sharing them on Facebook or tweeting them out on Twitter or whatever, but it doesn't, it isn't just that one tactic that's actually going right. to bring the final sale, right? The, the end of uh, shopping cart. Right. Absolutely. And I was thinking about that as, as you guys were, were talking, it's all about for me, balance and strategy. And so you look at your toolkit and in a lot of ways, what drives the greatest level of interaction, interactivity and, and profitability would be a TV commercial and possibly a catalog and possibly an email and possibly some paid search. And so I think you look at it at its entirety and you plan the cycle or the season or the event appropriately. I don't believe in the black and white, you know, move ex you know, from one extreme to the other. I think that there's balance and you look to see um, what mixture of media is gonna drive the greatest level of productivity for you and your brand. Okay, let's just face it. If I post a picture on my Facebook page of a Victoria's Secret model walking down the runway, I get lots of likes. We like looking at pictures. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's happened. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's really popular. I should yep. post more of that. Uh, but, but the type of product that you're selling makes a really yep. big difference on the ultimate sure. sale too. And I think specifically when you think about the undergarments, right? The bras, the panties, especially like bras, right? So like we want to make sure they fit correctly. And that's a really difficult thing to, you know, I mean, I don't know how many of you guys out there have experienced this, but certainly from a female perspective, this is something that you have to make sure fits. How do you, how do you bring that personal experience of actually touching the garment, feeling the garment, wearing the garment uh, to the internet sale and make it successful? It, 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 it really depends on the customer and what the level of comfort is. Some customers um, exclusively want to go in store, have a face-to-face -face conversation, and be fit in person. Some customers are actually very, very fine with the tools that, that are available online, whether it be on a desktop or a mobile application, to help you find the best fit for you. And so, again, it goes back to... Uh, the customer and what they're comfortable with. And then some customers do a mixture of things. They might try on one or two things in store and then experiment online with having uh, you know, a handful of bras shipped to them that they can try on, whatever fits they keep, whatever they don't like, they return. And so it really, really depends again on the customer and her level of comfort. But you do need to give her a variety of ways in which to do it that makes sense for her. No cookie cutter here, really. Um, it, it depends on the customer. How have you seen the industry, specifically over the last five years that you were with Victoria's Secret? Um, we talked about the brick and mortar store, people yep. going into the store versus e-commerce. How much did that change um, in the industry as a whole? Maybe not just with Victoria's Secret, but certainly in the um, um, under apparel portion of the industry. Right. Uh, uh, significant. I think uh, Victoria's Secret, like many other brands, probably five years ago, um, online sales are 40, 50 percent of overall business of overall direct business and um i think it's probably like 90 plus percent of the direct business these days and so um it, it, game game changing no no two ways about it and then mobile 
um, becoming very popular in the last couple of years is really um, taking the lion's share of that activity, that digital activity. And so it continues to change as technology advances and, and, and as, as customer behavior changes as well. Victoria's Secret was known for the um, supermodels wearing the lingerie down the runway and have very branded towards this kind yep. of supermodel feel, right? Mm -hmm. But Adore Me, which is the brand that you're um, focusing on right now, is, you know, it's all about the personal experience. You even right. have people who take, have like their brand representatives, they're actually customers that are wearing the product. I mean, that's a big change, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And I have to say, it's one of the things that really excited me about working with Adore Me. Um, when you find a company that is super passionate about the customer and says things like, you know, we believe beauty comes in all shapes, all sizes, all ages, all ethnicities. How could you not be excited about that core promise or the core principle? To me, that is that speaks exactly into the sweet spot of millennials, but really is something that um, makes you proud of what you do day in and day out. And so um, it, it's very much about their DNA. It's very much about an inclusive brand versus an exclusive brand. Um, you don't have to be a supermodel or look like a supermodel because that isn't the only form of beauty. You could be who you are and still be absolutely gorgeous. And, 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 and a, a company like Adormi will help you do that. And so, um, yeah, I think it's a big change, but, but, but a, a refreshing one for me and one that I really feel passionate about. You're seeing this movement again. I, I mentioned women's apparel or with specifically women's undergarments really being popular and all these, you know, True Company, Adore Me, and even Victoria's Secret going much more um, e-commerce focused. But you're also seeing, you know, all the different shaving, you know, um, websites to get shaving. I mean, so it's really this personal experience online. Yep. And a lot of these companies are using viral videos. I think Dollar Shave Club is one that comes right. to mind as one of my favorites. And uh, I still think that's a funny video. So, Brendan, how important is the brand creating something funny or engaging? I mean, is that the target or is it more about the message of the product? What, why, why are the, what's, the, what's the message that brands should focus on for their viral, hopefully viral video? Well, I think um, in terms of creating content that's shareable, um, there's. I, it's funny. I was actually just reading up a bunch of uh, studies about this, and um, the stuff that generates the most traction is um, what's been called like high arousal content. So the the stuff that it's not just going to make you smile or smirk or chuckle a little bit, but like is really going to make you laugh out loud. Or the inverse of that, you know, um, you get uh, you get really angry. Uh, obviously, a lot of brands don't want to do that with consumers, but <clears throat> ultimately, it's something that's going to generate like a real physiological reaction. And um, I think what's really interesting is while that is what's shareable, and I think innately everybody kind of knows that. Um, Brands have a tough time getting out of their own way and and speaking to people um, in a way that that feels real like that. Um, uh, and and you almost need to understand and approach it from not what is the message I need to get out first and foremost, but um, what is actually going to generate some mind mind share with people. And um, I, I think a, a, an example of a company that does this really really well is is um, GoPro. Um, uh, I know we were talking about this a bit yesterday, but um, obviously they're creating great content. And, and to a certain extent, they've got a lot of things in their favor. I mean, they're essentially a content company. Um, but the stuff that they've create that they empower people to create is really awe-inspiring. And, and a lot of people are watching that and they're actually like, you know, you, you gasp when somebody's, you know, jumping out of a plane and they've got a GoPro on their, their head. Um, so they've done a great job on the content side, and then they've also got the distribution down. They understand uh, really how to cultivate a community on the platform. They've implemented every you know YouTube best practice known to man, um, and they've managed to cultivate a community. And actually, the majority of their content comes from um, users who are evangelizing their product. Um, so they've done a good job with both uh, the, the content and the distribution components. And, and, you know, it's kind of 
it relates to this experience of the brand gets me, they know what I want to be, they know how I want to feel, kind of like a dormies, you know, using consumers to, right. you know, show off their product. I think GoPro does a great job. In fact, right. um, I'm a big fan and our, our CEO, Lisa, is wanting me to get them on Maverick. So if you're out there, GoPro, I need to get you on the show. But they hey, do a hey, great... Go hey, ahead. Tanya, just one thing I, I just wanted to uh, add on to that. I think it's also very important that um, you really understand your brand and your brand promise while you're um, dabbling in, whether it be video or apps or what, whatever the case may be, because sometimes the brand doesn't really warrant a certain type of video or a certain level of technology. You know, last year we saw brands introducing three, four, five different types of apps because they felt as though they had to because everyone else was doing it. And I would just caution to say that, you know, um, when you heavily lean into a YouTube or an app or whatever the case may be, make sure that it's really synergistic with your brand, your brand promise and your brand personality um, to get the most out of it. Just because someone else is doing it doesn't mean you have to or you should. I couldn't agree more. In fact, you and I have had this conversation about mobile and the app space and not every you know, your background before you got into women's undergarments was in the banking industry and you worked for a variety of different banks. And I think yeah. that makes sense for a mobile app, but that doesn't make sense necessarily for bras and panties because, you know, I'm not out. Oh, wait, I should order underwear, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think we have to look at all the channels we're using and, and viral videos aren't necessarily meant for every brand, brand either. Yeah. Um, but OK, so. GoPro does a great job of, I think, making us feel like who we want to be. I always say Pinterest is, um, I love Pinterest. I, Pinterest is the uh, the person we aspire to be. And I think GoPro does a really good job of implementing that in their product. And with their story is really interesting too, because they literally got started at, a, at just, you know, making, selling, I think, seashells on the seashore kind of thing. They were, <laughs> they got started with nothing. Um, they, they raised money for GoPro and they've been, hugely successful in kind of the organic startup space. Um, who else do you think, Brandon, is doing a good job in the space? Well, <clears throat> you know, I think the people that actually are, are probably most impressive in, and are going to be overtaking a lot of the, the more traditional brands out there are actually the brands created by the creators. I know we referenced um, what Bethany is doing. Um, and there, but, but there are a number of creators who are really using uh, these audiences and fan bases that they've cultivated to then uh, parlay that to promote some other um, some other passion of theirs or business. And, you know, a great example of this is um, guys like um, uh, uh, Charles Strippy, who's in the band We the Kings. He used his YouTube uh, audience to basically propel his band um, We the Kings latest album to the top of the iTunes charts. And, um, you know, they actually knocked out Beyonce from the number one spot um, two days after her latest album dropped. So there's like clearly a lot of value in these audiences. And these YouTubers um, are recognizing that and they're figuring out lots of different ways to tap into that audience and point it to different businesses and passions. And, you know, I know uh, Michelle Fan, who's the, the, the number one um, makeup uh, video blogger, she launched a, a company, um, subscription service company that's doing really well. They raised a round of funding. Um, and a lot of these YouTubers have uh, fairly large merch businesses and, you know, they're creating, um, you know, movies and TV shows. So um, I, I think that's probably what's most exciting. These guys understand how to leverage um, and communicate with audiences within this ecosystem in a way that a lot of more traditional marketers don't understand. But, you know, I also think it would be a bit of a an understatement to say that not everyone gets celebrity status on YouTube. And <laughs> yeah, that's true there. I think it's this. The percentage is very small, but you know, everyone aspires. You no, know, I'm going to have this great you know, channel and people are just going to start liking my stuff and I'm going to be really popular. I think what Bethany did was get started very early on and she's so young that she really related to young girls and she did a phenomenal job of that. So what's the secret sauce for somebody that wants to get on YouTube and, you know, make $40,000 a month and get their own clothing line and all of that kind of stuff? <laughs> uh, if I knew that answer, I'd probably be doing a channel. Um, exactly. No, I mean, I, I, I think it's really, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's marketing, it's identifying a niche, 
um, you know, uh, somewhere where you can add value that, you know, somebody's not addressing and ideally something that you're passionate about. And I think that's what all these creators have done. Um, they've pursued their passions. Luckily, there wasn't, you know, already an established audience out there. There are plenty of other people with the same passions and, and they cultivated a following. Um, but I, I think across the board, the people that have been really successful um, are people that just come across as human and um, they're not um, they're not approaching it from a sales first kind of standpoint. It's it's their passion first and then it becomes a job. And I think that that differentiation is really key because I think um, while it's 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 a little bit intangible when you are really excited about something that resonates with people. Patrick, you and I have had um, conversations about beyond the millennials. I mean, I think, you know, brands like GoPro, I think target a little bit more of the millennials or maybe the adventure side of, of some of the other age groups. But my, so I'm going to go back to, I, uh, I remember I was uh, interviewing um, a, an internet based, uh, uh, we'll just say GoDaddy. And they had a big campaign, whether you liked it or not, about GoDaddy girls. And I remember my mom and my aunt and my grandmother were listening to the show. And even my grandmother, who's in her 90s, hi, Grandma, uh, was was wanting to be a GoDaddy girl. So I think we all aspire to have this kind of fresh, you know, millennial feel to our lives. So how does the apparel industry approach that? Because I, you know, I I think Adormi is starting to approach on that. You've got a, a young daughter yourself, and mm -hmm. she's certainly impressionable. What, what message are now businesses and brands starting to pick up on as far as engaging a broader audience. Right. Yeah, I, I think it goes back to um, a healthy body image, uh, inclusivity. There are many different types of beauty. I think old school, old retail was picture perfect runway model. And that was what you aspired to look like and aspired to be. I think today, especially the millennials reject that. When you see the reaction to all the photoshopping that's going on and the touching up of, 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 of imagery, um, uh, people just don't want that anymore. They don't want to be um, fooled into what 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 is appropriate and what's not appropriate. And so I think it's about honesty. I think it's about authenticity. I think it's about all of those things and making sure it flows through, not just in uh, your brand promise, but in your in in who you choose to model your uh, apparel and the way in which you you merchandise your apparel and the stories you tell. Um, as you're trying to engage a customer. It, it needs to be real. It needs to be honest. It needs to be authentic. It needs to be very, very low um, retouched uh, because um, that's just not honest. And so I think it's about all of those things um, to really cut through today. And it seems like heritage brands, um, and, and certainly Victoria's Secret is one of them, but there's a lot of other heritage brands out there that have this, I think, attitude. And I'm not saying that Victoria's Secret does, but there certainly are a lot of heritage brands that feel like, um, hey, this is how we've always done it. This is what we're going to do moving forward. And you see startups like Adormi or True Company or others, you know, that are trying to are trying to come up with a more personal feel. They're trying to right. engage consumers in a different way. What would your message be to the heritage brands who do see, you know, like you said, 90% of their business moving to internet-based content. So they're competing now at a much more equal platform to these other startups. What do they need to do different? I, I, honestly, it's about not fighting the trend because it's done. Um, it's, it's embracing it. And it's going with it. And I, I, I hate to keep on saying the same thing, but I think technology is a great facilitator for getting to really know your customer and understanding customer intimacy. And it's about doing all of those things because the minute you nail how the customer wants to experience you, where he or she wants to experience you, um, it, it permeates everything you do. And uh, the bigger brands, the more established brands have, are having a tougher time doing it because they've had success in the past with the way in which they've done things. It's kind of like a broadcast approach to um, engaging or interacting. I hate to even call it interacting, but engaging with a customer. And the newer brands, the startups, they don't really have that, that baggage to deal with. They get to start fresh and new as an authentic consumer-based organization. And that's what the consumer wants and needs and demands today. 
you know, startups um, certainly they can get funding and there's programs out there like Kickstarter and many more that can help them or they can go to a VC or maybe they just go to friends and family and raise money, yeah. but they still don't have the deep pockets that a company um, the size of like a Victoria's Secret or many other types of brands have to use the internet to, you know, whether it's contextual targeting or other types of, of, you know, internet based, uh, you talked about email campaigns. I mean, so how does a, a, a small business, a startup in the space compete against the big heritage brand? You, you don't out the gate, but you compartmentalize and you, and you prioritize. So for example, a, a brand new, a startup, their focus and their activity is going to be about establishing their brand. So all of their activity is about the brand um, and about building what the brand means. Um, and there are so many actually inexpensive ways to do it digitally versus old school, um, the way it, it was done back in the day. Uh, and, and, and so you start in a way piecemeal. You kind of build the business as you go along, but you really have to pick off the bits and pieces that are the most meaningful, and most impactful, and just kind of layer it as you, as you go and as you build a a, um, a, a customer base that has a tremendous amount of recency. So I've been influenced. I'm going to admit that I've been influenced not just by GoPro. And um, I put things on my Pinterest page of the person that I want to, I aspire to be. You know, I, I have two snowboards and um, I attribute some of that to Red Bull, which is mm -hmm. really good in the viral video space. They've done some really great jobs. Brandon, you've actually talked about Red Bull Um what is it that Red Bull has figured out that some of the other brands haven't? Well, yeah, I think um, kind of going back to what I was talking about earlier, they they understand how to tap into people's passions. And, um, you know, they've actually, there's, there's this larger trend that a lot of brands are trying to be media companies. And Red Bull is probably the only one that I can think of that's actually legitimately pulled that off. They focus first and foremost on um, creating great content and distributing it, distributing it in a way that people um, will actually want to interact with it and share with it. And and lucky, luckily for them, kind of going back to what Patrick was saying earlier, like you've got to make sure that there is an alignment with the, the platform you're using and, and making sure it actually um, is relevant to your brand. Luckily, you know, Red Bull's whole brand platform is Red Bull gives you wings. And as a result, you know, them being involved in extreme sports and people jumping out of airplanes and all this awesome content that people really actually enjoy looking at. Um, uh, it makes great video and it uh, it represents their brand in a really relevant way. You know, one um, of the, well, well, I want to interject that one of the things that I think that we talked about earlier that's so important that is that it's not just creating great content and great content certainly depends on what your audience thinks is great content. So it's what the viewers are thinking, it's what they're liking, but they also do a really strong grassroots movement uh, to to their campaign. I mean, you see them if you go, I, you know, coming from Colorado, the, especially in the mountain towns, they're at, you know, these, you know, whether it's uh, skateboarding or, or snowboarding or, um, you know, dirt biking. I mean, you see Red Bull branded at these events. And I think GoPro probably has done the same thing. I think they're kind of similar from the standpoint of understanding uh, even the Mountain Dew, I think, did that at some point. They really understood they needed to be uh, where their consumers were. So it wasn't just being on the internet. But again, it goes back to, uh, but that costs money, right? And creating really good content, hiring an agency, it costs money. I mean, how, how you know, let's, you two, Brandon, I mean, how, how can a small person, a small business uh, use YouTube as a platform? How can they understand the nuances of the platform? Uh, maybe they don't have the kind of money to bake really great, you know, high quality digital videos, but they want to use YouTube. So how can they do that on a kind of a low budget? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be honest, I think in a lot of ways that um, approaching YouTube from, uh, you know, a big brand standpoint in a lot of ways can be a disadvantage because then you tend to skew for more like, uh, go more the commercial route, highly produced. And that actually tends to not really work that well mo most of the time. Um, I think actually speaking to people as humans on a real personal level is what resonates the most. And, um, you know, we're talking about the, the brands that are successful on YouTube, but um, it's also, if you look at it uh, compared to Facebook and Twitter, um, the top, you know, 50 or so, profiles uh, on Facebook and Twitter, they're filled up with brands who have essentially bought their way there. Um, on YouTube, 
it's much harder to buy your way. Um, you can't buy subscribers. There's no uh, media platform for that. So th the majority of people really got there through uh, hard work. And it's primarily, um, you know, uh, organic grassroots content creators who are doing little more than, um, you know, webcam videos oftentimes. So it, it's, it's, it's less about what I can produce, but more how I can create an emotional connection. And parallel to that, though, um, YouTube provides a lot of resources. There are a ton of free resources. Um, I'm totally going to sound like a, uh, a salesman for YouTube, but, you know, they've got production spaces uh, in L.A. They're creating one in New York. Um, they've got uh, a whole uh, YouTube creator playbook and brand playbook that basically lays out, this is exactly what you need to do and this is how you do it to, um, you know, optimize uh, uh, your content for the platform and make the most out of it. So there's a lot of uh, inexpensive, inexpensive resources out there what that are, actually are successful. What are brands like Pepsi, and you work with Pepsi, you work with Budweiser, yep. big budgets, big dollars yeah. they can spend to try to create something that people will like and want to share on social media. What is it that they're focusing on um, as far as creating a viral campaign? Totally. Um, in terms of viral, um, well, Pepsi's had a string of hits, and I haven't worked on any of these, but uh, I wish I had. They're pretty funny. Um, if you look up, there's uh, Test Drive and Test Drive 2. Uh, they did a, a series of videos with Jeff Gordon, who's a NASCAR driver, and they had him dress up in disguise and um, in the most recent one, he basically uh, was in a cab and he picked up uh, this blogger from Jalopnik, which is a big car blog. Um, and he was in disguise uh, as, a, as a kind of like an ex-con taxi driver who wouldn't pull over when a cop car was trying to pull him off to the side of the road. So the guy in the back of the cab is freaking out. He has no idea what's going on. And uh, I mean, it was it was hilarious and, and um, kind of to to skip ahead a little bit ultimately pranks are doing really well that's definitely a great go-to and actually bud light uh basically did a big prank for their uh youtube um or sorry their super bowl campaign the up for whatever they took uh, a guy out all over the town and you know w one minute he'd walk in, into a room and be playing ping pong with uh arnold schwarzenegger and the next he's getting into an elevator uh with a goat and um so, so pranks are doing really well, and I think part of that goes back to kind of the the emotional connection. Um, pranks are a little bit safer for brands. It's funny, but it's also getting um, a response from people. People are laughing, you know, along with it, and that's tapping into that kind of like uh, uh, that those emotions that are critical in in driving sharing. How important is comedy? And that you make a good point. I think I, I remember both of those campaigns. I thought they were really funny. How important is comedy? I mean, are we seeing more of a cinematic approach that works or is it the funny prankster approach that's working? Uh, you know, I, th I think it can be either so long as it's actually funny. Um, you know, there was actually a, a study done um, in this book. I was just reading the, the science of sharing. And uh, this woman, um, a professor in Australia, I think, analyzed something like 350 billion streams of online video. And um, the, 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 the most shared type of content and um, the emotion that was most shared was uh, content that was hilarity, um, you know, funny content. So I think so long as you're tapping into that emotion, um, however you bring that to life is, is ultimately what's going to generate traction. Um, but a lot of marketers struggle with that. They, they think something's funny and it's really just a little bit out of touch. <laughs> out of touch. You know, I, um, I think sometimes I think I'm funny and I'm not sure <sighs> I, Anthony would, would agree that maybe I, Maybe I'm not as funny as I think I am, but I, I do think that comedy is a big part of it. But I also think it's this kind of reality feel because you're talking about, you know, organic content. You're talking about the things that even big brands are trying to make things look more reality, right? They're trying to make it yeah. look like the a prankster. I mean, everybody wants to have this very reality feel, which again goes back to this idea of sharing the kinds of content that we want online, like um, Adore Me has done. Okay, so how do you know, Patrick, that something like this is going to work in the apparel market? I mean, you're doing it, but what kind of data are you using to say, yep, we get it. 
you guys want us to be more aware of what you want, and so we're doing. I mean, are this are you already seeing sales? I mean, how are you competing based on that's, that mentality? That's exactly the point that I was going to just bring up because one of the things I think that's really critical in this conversation is what what are you calling? What are your success measures? And so if it's just about driving, well, just about driving traffic uh, or engagement, it's one thing, and you can kind of measure that. But ultimately. When you're driving and managing a business, you're you're trying to drive profitability, you're trying to drive sales or sales through the funnel. And so for me, um, you really have to be very specific about what the end game is. And so when when you say a video was successful, or it, it's interesting because the um, the video that Brendan just mentioned, I loved and shared with my sons for weeks, but I couldn't tell you who the brand was. I remember the video, and I remember exactly what happened, the phase one and the phase two, and the guy came back and he didn't believe it, all of that it was awesome. But I couldn't remember who actually sponsored it. And so then I, in my mind, if I were the brand owner, I would be kind of upset about that because there wasn't enough about the video that resonated with me who would actually, who sponsored it, who did it, who was behind it. And so I think it's critical that when you create these events and these situations that it's still supports the brand and still supports productivity. And it's not just for the sake of doing it. Um, but to, to get to your point, Tanya, it's absolutely about ultimately looking at the level of activity you're driving uh, to the dot com or the mobile site. And it's ultimately how many customers are you converting profitably? Um, if it isn't about that or building a brand or both, I'm not sure why you're doing it. How important is social responsibility, Patrick, to the brand, whether it's a big brand um, that certainly has the money to back up being very socially responsible or even a small brand? I mean, even as a business leader, as the head of marketing for such a big brand, how how is social responsibility play in? I think it's very, very important, especially when you talk about this kind of new generation, the millennials coming up. It's one of the things that's extremely important to them. Um, it's extremely important to me just personally. Uh, I, I think it, it is a key factor in um, establishing a, uh, a significant brand in, in, in today's environment. Absolutely no two ways about it. Um, I also believe that um, the, way in, the way in which a brand treats their customers and a way in which a brand treats their associates is also very important, too. And I think it's also overlooked as a key attribute to brand success. Abercrombie and Fitch has been touted for not being very um, liked because they have they're very discriminatory about who they want seen wearing their products, right. and um, they've gotten a lot of backlash in the media about it. And we definitely have seen sales decline for them. I mean, but is that just an isolated case or brands that maybe are? And and I would say if you have a product and you want a certain type of person to buy your product, I don't know necessarily think in general that that's a bad thing, except you don't, I also think that you have to be considerate of, of, you know, the kind of message you're putting out there and you have to be able to accept that not everybody's going to like that. So right. are, but are we really going to see people stop buying products because somebody is not socially aware with their brand? I think you're, I think there are many factors affecting big brands today. I think it will be one of them. And it really depends on how well the brand does in other arenas. But again, if you think about the millennials and we're all kind of chasing after the millennials and the millennials um, eyeballs, I think it's specifically meaningful to that group of individuals. And you will see individuals turned off. If they feel as though a brand is not socially responsible or aware um, uh, with, within the environment, uh, whether it be, um, you know, wh whether the brand is green or, you know, how they're treating their employees or, you know, how exclusive versus inclusive they are. All of those things, I think, specifically is very meaningful to the millennials. You know, Brandon, I know you don't work for YouTube, so you can't really speak to the internal operations of the organization. But having worked with them and, you know, certainly if anybody Googles you on or looks up your Wikipedia, you've got a long history of being successful with the platform. How how does YouTube make sure that the content out there is and maybe, you know, if it's not socially responsible, certainly isn't offensive? I mean, is that something they care about? Uh, you know, I can't speak to their exact process necessarily, but I know they've got some sort of filtering in place. Um, 
that said, there is a lot of outreach that they do with both brands and creators to help kind of guide them down the path of what's appropriate. Um, but in terms of censorship, uh, I don't think they typically get involved unless something's, um, you know, pretty terrible, to be honest. <laughs> Pretty terrible. That's that's, uh, <laughs> that's open ended. Who who would decide what pretty terrible is, right? Uh, um, okay, so YouTube is, is is a good place. There's a lot of other social platforms out there. Um, you have you've been on the marketing side, the agency side of the business, Brandon, for a while. I know you're headed to the next web to talk about viral videos and how important they are. Um, but again we don't completely understand, although we think comedy is important and some sort of reality concept is important. What are you going to say at the next web and what's, what's your big message you want to get across? Yeah, totally. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, without giving the whole, uh, talk. No, away, basically, give it away yeah, right now. Yeah. We are um, all going to be there, right? <laughs> I think it might be live streamed actually. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, really what I'm going to be talking about is kind of like, a, 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 I'm trying to distill it into three sections, really. I mean, one, um, you know, content's important. Um, it's really critical, but content to a certain extent is being commoditized. And so um, you've got to keep in mind that to even have a shot at standing out, you've got to create something that's going to incorporate those high arousal emotions, um, you know, like those studies I referenced. The, the second component is really um, all about incorporating an audience, um, you know, some sort of a community and speaking to them very directly. I think oftentimes, in, in, in particular in marketing, people tend to say, well, I want to target everybody. But the instant you do that, you're really not talking to anyone. Um, so you've got to you've got to speak very directly to uh, uh, your core audience um, and uh, get them involved in the campaign, um, get them invested somehow. I mean, there's a number of ways to do this, whether it's, you know, you provide them some sort of exclusive behind the sneak, uh, behind the scenes kind of sneak preview, um, really get give them a reason to care about it. That's highly, highly relevant to them. Add some sort of value. Um, and then thirdly, um, one thing that's really, really interesting um, is uh, the fact that um, the perception, the way um, we kind of view content um, and kind of the, the social proof surrounding it plays a big role in whether or not we're even going to view it or share it. It can be the same piece of content, but if it's something that, um, you know, it's, it's maybe been up for 24 hours, but it's got a bunch of comments and you've seen the bloggers you like and follow uh, talk about it and there's a bunch of engagement your odds are you're going to share it and and it's 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 it really taps into this kind of um human psychology where um you know we tend to kind of follow crowds and um the more you can kind of pull all your levers at once and build in that distribution plan the more likely you are to then kind of create this self-fulfilling prophecy and in, in kind of driving sharing because people see it being shared they then want to go share it. So that's kind of the the, the 50,000 foot view. Yeah, well, I tell you what, um, I'm interested in, I, if there is a live stream, I'm going to watch it, but uh, but I'm interested, certainly we'd love to have you come back. And, and Patrick, you know, from the standpoint of what you're going to be, what you're watching for, I know Omni uh, Channel, which is a, you know, industry term we're hearing a lot lately. We talked about it on our last show with Aaron Strout. Um, why is that important to you right now? Um, because it really boils down to customer experience. I think it's funny about Omni Channel. You know, years ago, everyone was using the bud word CRM, and CRM made, meant so many different things. Uh, Omni Channel is kind of the same thing. But Omni Channel to me means customer experience. It means a connected customer experience for a brand. Um, so regardless of where he or she experiences the brand, it's consistent. Consistent product, consistent um, pricing, consistent um, capabilities. Uh, it doesn't really make a difference whether she's on the mobile device, she's in the store, she's online. Um, you know, it, it, it makes no difference. Her experience is the same and it's holistic. And so I do believe for retail specifically, omni-channel is the focus and it's really it really has to be the focus. And I think the only way omni-channel can be um, accomplished is if retailers really and truly make a commitment to understanding the customer holistically, a single view of the customer, using um, a one-view database, understanding where, she, where he or she's shopping, what they're buying, how they're buying, and what they want. 
Those are all the major components to establishing a really healthy omni-channel strategy. Okay, and as at Adore Me, you're encouraging your uh, customers to um, post photos of themselves, uh, the yes. products that they like. Are you going to be posting photos of yourself? Because that might be <laughs> It depends on if you want it or not. I always respond to customer requests, but I don't think there'll be many coming through for that. <laughs> You've got the background. I mean, if you're, if you're watching the show, I mean, I, knew, I gotta give I you. I knew you were gonna go there. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta gotta set the stage for you. Patrick's got this nice little like, what is it? A leopard? Is that no? That's zebra it's, skin. It's actually the... a, it's, it's a zebra. <laughs> It's a zebra is what it is. Brandon. Um, and, it, and it looks cheesy as I'm looking at it now, but it's really not. It's kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, it definitely <laughs> looks like you're a player. And Brandon, right. you didn't bring your A game. You're at mom and dad's house? <laughs> <laughs> I had to go home before uh, before I fly out, and I'm going to be gone for a few weeks and haven't uh, seen my parents. So, yeah, I'm, I'm at my parents' house right now. <laughs> You know, next next time, I think you could take a lesson out of Patrick's playbook and uh, and step up your little uh, image there with some, you know, leopard skin in the background, maybe some some purple pillows, some satin, you know, something like that. A big picture of Elvis in velvet, something like that. Right. <laughs> Have you guys seen my apartment? <laughs> <laughs> we just we'll be looking it, for huh? it on YouTube. <laughs> I, I really appreciate you both coming on the show today. I think that um, I've certainly learned a lot. I think, you know, Patrick, you're certainly somebody to follow it. As a leader, I think you're really inspiring. I'd love to have you come back. If somebody wants to follow you, Patrick, and uh, learn more about Adore Me or what you're doing, what's the best way they can do that? Uh, probably Twitter uh, at PAdamsNY. Uh, that's probably the best way to contact me and DM me uh, for sure. Okay. And Brandon, I know you're going to be at the next web and traveling abroad. I mean, I saw your passport pictures on Facebook. <laughs> I have to say, I don't know what you were thinking with the first passport photo, but you've definitely, uh, you've definitely improved. Um, and, uh, you'll be traveling a lot. So, but if somebody wants to connect with you, maybe follow what you're doing at the next web or, um, any of your other adventures, how can they do that? Yeah. Uh, Twitter is probably the best way to get hold of me as well. It's just at Brendan Gann, B-R-E-N-D-A-N-G-A-H-A-N. And I want to thank both of you for coming and spending some time with me and your busy schedules on the show today. I appreciate that. Thank you awesome. for having me. That was our episode of Marketing Mavericks, all about YouTube, all about um, the startup space and women's apparel, everything included. Next week, we've got a great guest coming up. We're going to talk to Evan Green, who's the head of marketing for the Recording Academy, the Grammys, and more. Everybody, thanks again. And that concludes this episode of Marketing Mavericks.